Um, so my name is Ben O'Day. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about business patterns in Apache Camel. Um, to start with, since I know half the audience, um, do you guys know Camel at all, the rest of you? A little bit? Somewhat? A little bit? Good. I need somebody that knows nothing, because a lot of this is basic, but it's, uh, it's kind of a deep dive into end-to-end -end use of Camel. And from there, we'll just jump right in. And feel free to interrupt, since there's only eight of us in here, so it's very informal. All right, so the goals of the presentation, uh, you know, give you a quick intro to Camel, talk about when to use it, uh, what are some of the use cases that are applicable for it, uh, how to navigate some of the options, so there's various components and patterns, lots of them, so just kind of give you some over, an overview of how to navigate those um, and in an effort to choose from those to solve some common use cases. Uh, then we'll talk about the SDLC, Software Development Lifecycle, with regards to Camel, and then if time permits, which it probably won't, we'll talk about refactoring le legacy apps. Um, the overall goal is just to give you kind of a high-level end-to-end overview of how Camel can be used to solve some common business problems. And I put a little note on here if you don't like Prezi, because a lot of people don't like these transitions. They make them sick. But if you don't like it, there's a PDF if you want to pull it down. Anybody want that URL going once? Nope, OK. All right, so my background, uh, IT consultant from San Diego, originally from the Midwest. Um, been doing IT consulting for about 15 years and working with Apache Technologies for about five years. Um, why I like to use Camel. Um, overall, I think it really simplifies uh, development for the type of development I'm doing anyway. So I know there's all different layers of design and development. But for a lot of common business use cases, it really works well to um, allow you to leverage uh, common integration uh, technologies and patterns. So we'll get into those later. Also, just wrap some of the common technologies through components. And uh, overall, it promotes patterns and best practices. Um, and I think the core strength of it is really allowing you to uh, abstract complex logic or complex integration uh, details and let you focus on the logic. Um, and that's done with routes. And we'll get into that in a second. So here is an overview of way too much material for this presentation, but we're going to get through as much of it as we can. So jumping right into the intro for Camel. So here's the executive summary. Again, kind of high level, but this is the pitch to management. Um, obviously, it's 2.0 license with Apache. It's uh, termed as an open source messaging framework. That's generally what people use it for, but it can do a lot of different things. Um, there are over 100 components and 58 pattern implementations, and hundreds of different or thousands of different configurations of each of those. Um, so part of the reason for this presentation was to help you get a catalog of what's out there and help you drill into some of the common um, configurations to use. Uh, overall, it's backed by a big community. It's also designed to integrate with many of the other Apache projects. Um, what Camel is not, uh, it's not an ESB, it's th though it does similar things in terms of routing. Um, you really, it's not a container on its own, so you need service mix, or you can use a full-blown um, ESB like Mule. Um, it's not a message broker either, uh, although it's often used with ActiveMQ. Um, and obviously, it's not a container. You have to run it inside of something like Tomcat or Carafe, generally. So here's a, uh, it's a good diagram to kind of summarize the overall Camel architecture. So at the core, you've got the Camel context. So this is basically what binds together all the different pieces of Camel. Um, so you can see at the bottom, you can see the different components. Um, and these are pluggable, basically route-enabled API wrappers that, that uh, that Camel has to, to basically minimize the effort to integrate these different technologies into Camel. Uh, so you can see file, JMS, HTTP. And then on the right, you can see the processors. So these are the EIP implementations. So this is the, the standard enterprise, enterprise integration pattern implementation. And, um, and there, then back in the center, you can see the routes. So these are the from and to clauses. We'll get into the more details of these in a minute. But this is basically showing you the Camel context exists really to host routes and to bind all this together to allow you to route data from endpoint to endpoint. So that being said, here's a quick example of uh, basically how the Camel context is set up and a simple route is defined. 
So like I said, the, the camel context is, is really the, the glue that kind of holds all these other components together. It's kind of like a registry in a way, it's like a spring context where you, you're going to register everything you want to use, set up all the configuration. Um, this can be done in spring or it can be done programmatically like you see here. And I did, this is obviously a pretty simple example, but it shows you how few lines of code you really need to uh, stand up a camel context and to find a route. Just all to review for you guys? No? Yes? Okay. I'll keep moving. Um, so some of the building blocks of Camel. Um, exchange is basically the payload that gets passed uh, through the route, and it contains um, generally an end message and an out message. You can see from the diagram that you, this is basically a route showing the different steps in the route and how the exchange gets passed into a processor and out to the subsequent processor. Um, and all of, the, all of the routing is defined with uh, what's called a DSL, and there are several different DSLs that can be used. So a Java and the Spring DSL are the most common. Those are all the examples I'll show you today, but if you like Groovy or Scala, you can use those as well. And a route is basically just defining a consumer in the from clause, generally, and producing to somebody in the to clause. And uh, that's very simplified, but that's basically what routes do. So, and then EIPs, we already talked about these, the enterprise integration patterns. Uh, we'll drill into some of these examples, and then obviously the components, these wrap the technologies and let you route enable those technologies. And we'll get into some of those examples in a few. So if you are just getting started with Camel, uh, here's a few of the uh, first steps that I'd recommend. Uh, in particular, you know, pick up Camel in Action, it's a good book. It's if, if anybody's brand new to Camel and they start asking questions out on the forum or Stack Overflow, we generally just point them to go read the book because it's it summarizes it really well. Otherwise, there's some good articles and blogs out on the Camel website. Um, and then after you get over that first learning curve, then I would uh, pull the source code down and take a look at the unit tests. That's a really good way to drill into anything you don't understand. There's good unit tests out there. Um, and then some of the re um, related technologies that are worth looking into. Obviously, Maven's used, used uh, a lot through, throughout all these projects. Uh, Spring, JMS, CXF, Carafe, and then just general EIPs. Those are all not required, but generally used with Camel. And then if you're tasked with building a demo app, um, you know, there's a couple options. You know, ActiveMQ is one. If you're going to use JMS or messaging anyways, it ships with Camel. You can simply add routes to the Camel XML that ships with it. Um, otherwise, you can use a Maven archetype to stub out a simple Camel project, and then you can run it with a, with a Maven plugin. Those, those are all really quick ways to get a demo up. So any questions on that? We're moving on. All right, so uh, a little bit about why to use Camel. So this is a little high level, but again, this is kind of a, uh, a brain dump of all the things I have, all the things I've come across in terms of using Camel, justifying it to managers, to developers, to, to other clients, so it's kind of end-to-end, even though some of it's high level, so. Um, overall, what problems are relevant? You know, Camel does not fit every application type. It's really for routing data. So if you have complex routing rules, um, complex technology integrations, um, Camel can work well to simplify those. Um, also orchestrating services, so Binding together services from separate systems, Camel can work well on that as well. Uh, so along those lines, the type of requirements, highly event-based processes are generally the, the core use cases of Camel, but um, and along those lines, also exposing multiple endpoints to a common process. So let's say you have one process that processes orders, you might have multiple endpoints to receive orders. Uh, Camel excels at that, and I'll show you an example of that later. Um, also, some complex runtime management use cases fit well because Camel's got some pretty cool uh, runtime management controls. So here is a quick um, example of a good use case for Camel. So if you look to the far, the upper left, you can see there are several different inputs: um, XML, CSV, and over FTP, and then XML over HTTP. So this is just showing you different endpoints that Camel supports. And it's basically sending it through different EIPs to normalize this data and send it to a common order queue for processing. So it just shows you how to expose common logic to multiple endpoints. Any questions? All right, so 
along the lines of, of actually getting, getting Camel into, uh, into your company if you're not already using it. Um, obviously, it's an open source technology, and that's, that's a battle on its own sometimes with big companies. But um, overall, these are just you know, kind of my, it's my train of thought when I'm trying to, trying to get Camel into a client. Um, obviously, you need to justify your use of it. Um, really need to have a quorum of use cases before you jump right in and try to use it. Um, because there is an overhead and there's learning curve for a development team to use it. Um, so I like to say, you know, to management, you really need to position Camel as an integration technology. It's not, it's nothing more than that. It really allows you to bind processes together and not necessarily have to recreate all those processes. So it is a light framework, lightweight framework in that respect. Um, overall, I like to say it increases productivity because it allows a lot of reuse of patterns and abstraction to technology integration. And we'll get into some of these details in a minute. Um, so to the technical team, of course, you've got to sell it to developers as well. Um, you know, creating a POC, demo it, kind of common sense, I know, but um, the, the point being you need to highlight that it really does reduce common code, increases readability of, of business logic and testability as well. And it's really a simple framework to use. Once you, once you get over the initial learning curve of it, it's really simple to spin up a POC and expand on it. So sometimes Camel is not a good fit. Uh, kind of breeze through this. Obviously, there's, there's just some use cases that aren't good, a good fit for Camel. Uh, these are some of those low-level batch processes. Uh, full-blown web apps, you know, Camel supports HTTP, but it's not made for full-blown web apps. Um, and then, Obviously, simple one-off use cases are not, you know, may not need to bring in Camel for those. Uh, some of the quick alternatives to Camel, uh, Spring Integration, Mule ESB, these are often referenced. I won't go into too many details. Uh, they all have, they all overlap a little bit. Uh, overall, Camel's deemed to be a little more flexible. And there's a link to uh, a whole presentation on this topic if you're interested. All right, so a little bit about navigating options. So one of the main things that Camel lets you do is leverage components. So components are basically, uh, basically route-enabled APIs. So it basically takes a standard API, here's a simple example of a Java IO file, and wraps it so that you can route-enable it. So all I mean is that you can reference that technology from a route. And here's a simple example of using the file um, component to move data from an inbound directory to an outbound directory. Um, the beauty of it is just one line of code, and you can. There are tons of different configuration options you can use with that. Um, but that's this, the simplest case. Is that that's really what it does. Here are some of the underlying classes that implement that. So if you take a look at the source, you can see how it how it wraps that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, the more important part is really how do you evaluate components. So there are. You know, 150 committed to Camel. There are many more out on GitHub. Um, so, what do you need to consider when you're looking at components? So, first off, you got to find a component that meets your needs. So, you've got to identify, um, you know, the version of a technology that you want to use. So, let's say you're working with Hadoop and you're looking at using, you know, HDFS 2.0. Um, you need to make sure that the component that you're looking at within Camel supports that version. Um, and I referenced the parent Palm XML, so this breaks out all the different versions um, of all the different underlying components. And uh, the first point I kind of skipped over is consider the licensing. So obviously anything under the Camel repository is going to be Apache license, everything external to that, you've got to consider the licensing. Um, so obviously the supported configurations are also to be considered. So every component doesn't necessarily implement every possible option of a technology. So it's a it's generally a subset of those, so before you jump right in and sign up to use Camel to integrate some technology that you're interested in, you should take a look at the unit, you know, unit tests are a great place to start. Those generally exercise all the different configuration options. Um, and then producer versus consumer options as well. So some components su support one or the other or both, and sometimes it's a subset of some of the configurations. And we'll get into some of these examples soon, I promise. So there's a lot going on this slide. I just I tried to pick some of the uh, more popular components. Like I said, there are hundreds of them, um, and try to categorize some of the more interesting ones. Um, I won't go into too many details, but uh, you can see some of the general categories. Um, obviously, big data and search and caching are, are some of the hot new ones. Um, 
And yeah, there's obviously a lot of protocol integrations and um, also some good testing debugging support. And we'll get into some of these use cases in a minute. What was it? I have never used it with Camel, so no. I just know there's a component that exists. Um, same thing with you know, Zookeeper and Splunk. Those are fairly new, um, or at least Splunk was a fairly new addition, um, but I haven't worked with it directly. I'll get back to you. Um, so here's a list of all the components, not meant to be read, just to show you that these are all committed to Camel. Lots of them out there. Um, so let's say you found a component you're ready, you want to use, so what do you, where do you get started? So the point of this is that there's a spec page out there, there's samples, there are unit tests, that's the place to start. Um, and then if you want to include that in your project, you generally will start with uh, adding a dependency to your Palm XML if you're using Maven. If you're using, not using Maven, you need to find that jar, drop it in your class path. Um, and then I generally recommend getting started with a uh, unit test. Uh, this just allows you to kind of sanity test your setup and test out your, your configuration options. And, you know, overall, you know, the goal of this is to integrate this into your app, so you need to make sure you've got your Camel context set up, which we talked about a little bit before. You can use Spring or just programmatically. Um, and then a route builder wired into your Camel context as well. And we'll get into that in a second. So taking a quick look at, uh, this, is the, this is from the Camel component, or the file component um, page. So this shows you some of the sample use cases. So uh, this is just to show you some of the, the, the basic options. And uh, you know, there's, a, there's a page like this for every component, show you some of the samples. And then there's also, here's a quick example of a unit test. Um, we'll get into some more exciting test cases later, but um, a simple example of how to use that component, how to, how to use a mock endpoint to validate data in this case. So mock endpoint is a camel technology to do assertions. Uh, custom components. So if there isn't a component that exists for what you're working on, you can always create your own. Um, but I like to say before you jump right in and start to create it, you should just consider wrapping it with a bean or a processor. So Camel integrates with Pojo code, allows you to route enable it very easily. Um, and also has a technology called a processor, which is just a, a, a wrapper around Pojo code as well. So these generally can be used to route enable any kind of type of code without needing to create a, its own component. But if you do want to create a component, there's a simple way to do it, it's using an archetype to stub it out, and then you know, just some common sense uh, kind of maintenance in terms of what you do with that, that component. So I would create it you know, as a separate project within your company, put in your repository, version it just like anything else, include it as a dependency, and then obviously you can optionally uh, publish this back to Camel or to, to GitHub for others to use. Any questions on custom components? Well, it's, you would generally do it if you have, um, have a technology that's you know, proprietary to your company that you want to reuse across a lot of different projects. Is it, you know, I know it's kind of a vague answer, but um, if, you, if you just have one application that's going to reference um, that API, I would just you know, start with just wrapping it with a bean or a processor. Um, but if you have a need to reference it in a more complete, configurable way, that's when you'd, when you'd want to have a component, because that allows you to specify different configuration options right in the URI versus passing in properties to a, to a bean through like you know, dependency injection or something like that. So those are the trade-offs. So if it's something that's highly configurable and can be reused, reused across a lot of applications, then it's probably worth time investing in the component. It's not hard to create one, but I just advise people to look at the, the simpler approach first and if they need it, migrate into that. There's a great, there's great documentation out on Camel's site about how to, how to spin one up. So this next section is about patterns. So this is the next kind of core component of Camel is uh, really enterprise integration patterns. So uh, long story short, there are a bunch of implementations based on, the, uh, based on the EIP book, and they're designed to provide a common language, so not just, not just uh, for implementation, but also for design discussions. You know, it's a common vocabulary for how to solve problems. And at the end of the day, they're providing a reusable solution that's highly configurable and also route-enabled interface to that. So the, the whole goal of anything in Camel is to route-enable it, so you allow it to be referenced from a route. And we'll get into some examples of that in just a second. 
Uh, from a code perspective, all these EIPs are implemented behind the scenes with a definition class and a processor class. Uh, so if you ever want to see how an EIP is actually implemented, pull down the code and take a look at those, those classes and you can see that it's just good old Java. So here's a look at some of the, oh, the color is really bad on that, some of the um, different EIPs. And we're gonna drill into a few of them, but you can see these are the, you've probably seen these graphics all over the place. These are the common EIP patterns, or EIPs. So let's drill into one of those. So basic EIP usage. So all the code is in Camel Core. So if you wanna use it, all you need to do is include the Camel Core jar as a dependency in your project. Um, and then all the EIPs are accessible from any route. So all you need to do is start a route with a from clause and hopefully you're using an IDE that supports some type of code completion. Um, and it should give you the options that, that are available at any step within the route. So here's a couple examples of that. So content-based routing, this is one of the most commonly used one. Um, so if you look on the left, so, so at the end of the day, you're just trying to take in, in this case, an order um, and based on the data that's, that's sent in, you're gonna dynamically route it to one of two different endpoints, or three different endpoints in this case. So if you look at the Java DSL, it's really simple. Um, it looks just like an if-else kind of statement or a choice statement in, in, um, in straight Java, but this is just one long statement that's just uh, broken up, but it's just a choice statement. Um, in this case, we're looking at the header value, and if the path header is equal to B, it's gonna send it to the direct B endpoint, and you can see how it works, just basically an if-else kind of statement. And then on the right, doing something real similar with the Spring XML. Uh, a little different, it's using XPath instead of the header value. Uh, but you can see how it's, it, they're very similar, obviously. Uh, the Java DSL is a little more concise, but basically doing the same thing and have the same options. And here's another example, uh, the recipient list pattern. This is a pretty commonly used pattern, that's why I brought it up. Uh, it's a little abstract looking at it, but long story short, it's taking a collection, um, or expects a collection, and it's gonna send to a dynamically defined collection based on the message coming in. So in our case, it's gonna look in the header value for endpoints, and it's gonna pull the value out, and um, it's gonna assume it's a list of some type or a collection of some type and route dynamically to that. So you could pass in a message with header set to endpoint A, endpoint B, endpoint C, and it's gonna send to those um, endpoints dynamically. And same thing with the Spring XML on the right. Any questions about that? So in this case, you're saying if the data is coming from A, then send to all the endpoints registered? Or? Basically, it's saying any message that comes in to this endpoint here, uh -huh. it's going to look, look in the header of that exchange, and it's going to look for a property called endpoints. And then it's going to pull that out. It's going to assume it's a, a list or a collection, or you'll get an error thrown. And, um, and there's many different ways to do it. You could send a comment delimited list, you could send in all different kinds of, or a comment delimited string or anything. Um, and then dynamically just send to those endpoints based on the message that you send in. And we'll look at it, I think I've got an example of this as well. All right, so sorry, I know this is kind of moving slow. So chaining EIPs together, so really the power in all these EIPs is not just these one-off use cases, it's really chaining them together to do something interesting. So. Something to consider as you start doing this is that there's no, you know, it's more of an art than a science. There's no one way to do it. So there's all different types of granularity of routes um, to consider. You just gotta get started, start simple and, uh, and iterate is kind of what I say. But, um, so you need, you need to think about the messaging pattern that you're using. So if you're using an in-out, you know, request response type of pattern, it's gonna affect the granularity of your routes a little bit um, versus a in-only um, pattern. Um, also, the threading model and the error handling that you're going to implement might affect the, uh, how you're chaining these together. Um, overall, I just say, you know, start simple, high-level flow, stub out any of the complex business logic with, you know, a bean or a processor class, and then just iterate. Start adding, you know, add subroutines just like you would in Java. You know, you, add it, you don't add subroutines when you're normally called once. You do it once there's once you have a need to normalize it. So it's the same thing with building a camel route. So here is a quick example of a little more interesting uh, use case. Of course, my little logo is covering up the code, which is nice. Um, that's what you get when you don't pay for Prezi. They put their logo on it, so just FYI. 
Um, so this is called a composed message processor. It's basically a kind of a combined pattern of splitting, dynamically routing, and then aggregating results back together. And as you can see from the example, there's the uh, example code below, you can see it's just defining a, a direct endpoint to start with. So direct is just a, a basic synchronous, um, synchronous call. So it's basically um, when, you, when you pass in a message to this, it's going to block. It's going to use one thread throughout that route. It's going to block for the in entirety of that. So it's a synchronous invocation of a route. Um, in our case, it's going to call the split API to split that body out. So it's going to assume that there's a collection coming in. And it's going to use a choice statement to do your content-based routing, and then route it to the correct, you know, either widget inventory or gadget inventory in our case. Um, and then it's going to send it to a SATA, a SATA queue. So the SATA queue is the is the counterpart to the direct endpoint. It's the asynchronous um, way to route data. So it's going to use a blocking queue internally. So it's it's all in memory. But in this case, it's basically going to collect that data. And it's going to send it through an aggregator pattern, which is basically going to join up on the, you can see the, uh, the end of this route here. The header ID is what it, is the expression it's going to use to join up data to aggregate. Um, in this case, we're just using a, a timeout. So the aggregator is basically going to say, anytime data comes in that matches this order ID, I'm going to group it together until this completion timeout is reached. Then I'm going to send it downstream and aggregate it. So that's a pretty common pattern. We'll go into a couple other de uh, examples of that later. Any questions on that? No? All right, so here are a bunch of, the whole, whole point of this presentation originally was to go through a bunch of common use cases. So here's a laundry list of those, and we'll get through as many of them as we can. Um, to start with, uh, um, basically these are all broken down into a problem and, and one or more solutions within Camel. So here's a real simple one that's common to just about every app, so scheduling jobs. So you, you often have to schedule periodic processes or you're going to define routes to run at specific times. So here's a couple options for doing that. So there's a timer component. Uh, this is you know pretty bare bones, generally used for just fixed duration type jobs. Um, a quartz component that allows you to do cron-like expressions. Uh, so in these cases, both of those are going to run the run job process um, based on the uh, configured time. And then if you need a little more control, you can use route policies. So this is an example of a uh, cron scheduled route policy. So this allows you to find cron-like expressions to start and stop routes. So this is a little different than the first two because it's going to actually start the route. In this case, it's a consumer from an ActiveMQ queue. And um, so it's going to allow that consumer to run for, in this case, five minutes every hour um, versus the other two are going to trigger that route to one, run one time every time that's, it's invoked. So just two different, uh, does that make sense? Timer has been around for as long as I know. Jeff? One, probably 1.0. <laughs> yep. um, yeah, it's been around for a while. It's a pretty commonly used one. Go ahead. OK. I sure hope so. You run into something, an issue with using that, this policy? Yeah, it's a, it's, from the, from the you write, it's not obvious, yeah. Yeah, it, it's basically starting a background thread to say, I'm gonna, going to enable, it's going to use the life cycle of a route to start it up based on a timer or based on your scheduler. And yeah, to both start and stop the route in this case. It's, yeah, it is really cool. I, I don't see it used very often, but it's, it's a, it adds a lot more flexibility than the first two if you need something to run for a periodic, for a duration versus just one event to fire at a time. Yeah. Or it's, or it's uh, you know, some customers only want to process data over, you know, nighttime hours, but they don't want to limit it to just running once. They want to say, off peak hours, we want it to run this process so it doesn't affect, yeah. It's a pretty cool pattern. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So it's... Yeah, it'll 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 run for that duration, and any anything that shows up in that queue during that duration or was already in the queue 
will get consumed and anything that's still in there at the time it, it stops will stay on the queue until the next time it runs, obviously. Does that make sense? So uh, does Camel become uh, more competitive or do you have to install support around uh, uh, Quartz is not, is Quartz part of the Camel core? I'm really not sure. It might be a separate, uh, I think it's a separate one, right? Yeah, it's separate. So you have to include it as another dependency, but it's not, so it's not part of the core. Timer is part of the core. Um, so yeah, moving on to, uh, so route enabling Pojo code. So this is, uh, this is what I was talking about earlier. They're basically different ways to embed your Pojo code within, within Camel without having to modify it at all. So, um, so this is a common use case where you've got an existing application, you wanna route enable some of that code. So let's say you've got a process that, won't, that you wanna run, very similar to what we had on the previous page. So your run job process in this case knows nothing about Camel, nor do you wanna change it to let it know about Camel to introduce other dependencies. Um, you can wrap that with, with either a processor class, so internally, this processor is just an inline call within a route, and you can do anything in here. You can call, any, call anything, and that's, it's a way to route enable code. Um, bean integration is very similar. Um, it allows you just to reference a bean class, so it's something you could stand up in, you know, with Spring DI to, to wire it in. Um, but again, it uses some, there's some magic binding that's going on behind the scenes to basically take a message if you look at the first, uh, the first route, the direct start, it's gonna take the message you send in and pass it to, in this case, our example bean class, and it's gonna invoke a method on that class. So if you have multiple methods in that class, it's not gonna know which one to invoke. So if you only have one, it's gonna know. There's ways to annotate it to mark which one, um, but it's gonna try to match up. It's gonna use reflection to try to match up with the, the best fit. So something that has a parameter that matches the the data that you send into it, it will match up automatically. So it's pretty cool. So if you send in an order object and there's a method that takes an order, it's gonna find that method and it's gonna process it. And the output of that method is gonna get returned to the exchange for any subsequent steps in the route. So it's, it's a way to wrap that, in, that um, you know, core legacy logic that you won't have to change and just route enable. Does that make sense somewhat? Example maybe? No, no, that's just what it's for. Exactly. Yeah, you can. I mean, a processor is just just a very simple uh, camel um, class, and you know it's it's in line there. But you can you can set it up as a separate you know class to find elsewhere, and it just takes in the exchange, which again is that payload. You can pull anything out of the exchange. You can see in my example, I'm just pulling it out as a string. You can do something with it there, and then you can set it back on the exchange for whatever you have downstream. So that's a quick way to just wrap wrap that logic. That, that core business logic. Um, so I've got a bunch of these. I'm only gonna get through a subset of these, um, but I'll just kind of, I'll go until you guys ask questions. So decoupling processes, uh, this is another common pattern. Um, you need to increase system modularity. You need to support multi-threaded processing. So um, long story short, you need to use some type of asynchronous process to do this, right? So you've got to use, um, in Camel, you can use SATA, you can use ActiveMQ. These are two different patterns to do asynchronous processing. Um, internally, SATA is using a blocking queue, so it's gonna queue things up. Um, you can see from this example, it's gonna take things out of a file or out, out of a directory called orders, uh, send them to this SATA queue, and then you're gonna have a separate route that reads from that SATA queue uh, with uh, concurrent threads configured to, to process these things in parallel. So this is a simple way to decouple the consumption of orders from the file, send them to a queue, and process those in parallel. And the exact same example in ActiveMQ, obviously that adds JMS and durability if you set that up, but it's basically the same, same type of pattern. So, uh, you asked earlier about how to invoke, I think somebody asked about how to invoke a route. So, we've talked about how to set up a route, you know, the from and the to clause, but how do you actually send data to the route to, be, to initiate it? Um, so generally, there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, number one would be a producer template. So this is something that if you have a handle to the camel context, you can create this producer template. You define your URI that you want to go to, or your endpoint you want to go to. Um, you can see a real simple example of sending in the hello world 
uh, XML message there to the ActiveMQ, MyQ. Um, and, and you can optionally send in header values as well. So in this case, you're sending in a, a customer rating header as well. Um, and then, then there's some other you know, annotation-driven ways to do this. So you don't have to have a handle of the camel context. You can just annotate a POJO class with uh, endpoint injection. Um, and then there's a way to do it without camel APIs through spring remoting, very similar just to uh, basically wire in um, camel producer and consumer support through annotations. Uh, converting data, this is another cool pattern that really comes in handy because it's really easy to do, um, really easy to switch between common formats within a route. So you can see the, uh, you know, you have a lot of processes that expect one format and output another format in a process downstream that may expect a different format. Um, so this is a way to kind of bridge those processes within a route. You can see the example of basically using this Marshall API and there's a bunch of just out of the box conversion um, support for strings and XML and JSON and several others. Um, and then there's just, you know, there's also custom type converters that you can configure. Some of these are out of the box. I showed a few examples, but ways to basically convert that exchange into some, some format as you're going through a route. Uh, splitting data. So I'm sorry, these are, these are all starting to sound the same, but uh, this is another pattern that's pretty handy. Um, you can see from the diagram, you're basically taking one thing in, generally a list of some type, and you're splitting it out for downstream processing. So you can see the this case, we're just tokenizing. We're taking in data from a file. Uh, we're assuming it's tokenized by a, a line delimiter and splitting it up, sending it to the downstream process. Uh, and just, you know, I showed a few different variations of that, but basically doing the same thing. And there's, there's different performance considerations as well. If you have a large file, you don't want to tie up memory while you're doing that processing. So you can do that with a streaming call as well. Um, aggregating data, so we looked at this a little bit earlier. So this is another common use case. Um, where you need to combine data for processing or sending out, you know, to downstream processes in batches. Uh, one of the, so the use case here is, you know, taking in, uh, taking in inbound orders from a JMS queue, uh, aggregating those based on an order ID. So basically any orders that come in with the same order ID, probably not the greatest example because they're probably all unique, but let's say it's an account ID instead. Um, so all the orders that are tied to a given account ID would get aggregated based on your settings. So in this case, it's an or. You're either, either going to get 100 orders or you're going to get uh, hit your completion interval of 10 seconds. Whenever you get that group together, you can send those downstream. Um, one of the good use cases for that that I've used is uh, writing off to external systems like a database or I've used it with solar as well where commits are expensive. So you don't want to com call commit after every every time you send a message over. So you either want to batch those up or send those over one at a time and at, the, at a, some type of an interval call commit. So that's a, a common use for that pattern. Um, routing dynamically, there's a lot going on here, but I just wanted to show that there's several different ways to route dynamically. We looked at content-based router already. Um, you can also do a filter just to basically filter out which endpoints are going to get data based on messages coming in. Um, dynamic router gives you a little more flexibility, and then we talked about recipient list already. I'm just going to fly through that one because we already talked about it a little bit. Uh, so, we t so we talked a little bit about asynchronous processing before, but this is an, there's some other APIs within Camel to allow you to do uh, parallel consumption of messages and, and spin up multiple threads to process data. Here's just a few examples of some of the APIs. And some of these are specific to certain components or certain patterns, whether or not they can be used, but um, basically ways to define configurably define thread pools and mark steps in a route as being parallel, you know, basically if you mark it as parallel processing, it's gonna use a separate thread to con continue that process in the route. Um, and that shortens the latency back to a customer, customer call, so a client call in this case. Um, and again, decoupling the processes with SATA and JMS, we talked about that before, those are commonly used for the same reason. Uh, this is a pretty cool pattern that has nothing to do with Camel. It's really an active MQ technology, but I use it all the time in, in Camel, so I thought I'd call it out. So uh, there's often a need to process messages in a given order that they show up into a queue, for example, um, but you want to process these in parallel. So the, the uh, active MQ message groups is a cool pattern that basically solves this for you without doing anything. Um, all you have to do is set up this uh, cryptic JMS X group ID as a header before you put something in a queue, and then any consumers from that queue are going to single thread 
by that expression that, or by that value that you put in there. So in our case, we're putting in an account, or yeah, an account ID into the order queue, and the downstream consumer from that queue is going to honor that single-threaded nature, but it still allows you to do parallel processing across different account IDs, if that makes sense. So you've got 10 threads, and you send in 100 messages for different account IDs. It's going to process those in parallel, but single-thread for the, a given account, account ID. Kind of make sense? That's a cool pattern. That it really is, because you'd have to jump through hoops to do all type of locking and synchronization around related data that's going in. Um, service level agreement. So this is just a, a quick slide to talk about the, the throttler and EIP. This is kind of what I, I mentioned before. If you have a downstream system, you have an SLA in place, you can't overwhelm it by bombarding it with, with data or too many commits over frequency or you know, too many individual pieces of data. So you can use the throttler to basically throttle over a given time period. So here's a quick example of reading data from a SATA queue, sending it to the a bad, badly named processor called get data from client, which should be put data to client. Um, basically it's saying it's gonna throttle 100 messages over the given time period. So 100 messages every 60 seconds. It's gonna in introduce delays as soon as that's crossed. So it allows you to guarantee a, an SLA with a a downstream provider, a resource. Uh, aggregator EIP is very similar. Um, it's not going to introduce delays for each individual message, but it's going to aggregate those up and allow you to control how you're pushing data to your downstream process. Make sense, those two options? Uh, runtime management, so this is what we talked about a little bit before with uh, route policies, um, but there's often a, a need to either programmatically or manually control routes at runtime. So this is one of those, um, you know, basically technologies that allow you to uh, support, you know, error handling or monitoring your, uh, your applications. We use it all the time to programmatically start and stop routes based on error scenarios. Um, a couple different options. You can use JMX um, to either manually or, or programmatically uh, start and stop routes. And um, if you have a handle to the camel context itself, you can also call basically any of those lifecycle um, APIs on a route directly just by the route ID. And then uh, we talked about the route policies before. Same thing, there's just some event methods that you can uh, hook into to do any uh, dynamic route policy logic. Here's a quick example of one, which is entirely useless, but it demonstrates it. So you can see at the bottom where you define the route, direct, direct uh, foo, route ID foo, um, and then the route policy that you set up on it. In this case, it's basically saying the lifecycle method on exchange done. So after that route finishes, it's going to trigger that method. In this case, it's going to look for the body of that message to be stop. If, that, if that's equal, then it's going to actually stop the route, stop the consumer from the route. So it would stop the route. Pretty contrived example, but you can see how you could uh, do some pretty cool things with it. So um, this, again, is not really specific to Camel, but it's worth mentioning. It's a way that I've seen Camel used a lot. Um, basically to, to fulfill this messaging bus pattern. So there's often a need to um, basically bridge applications with uh, some type of a common data format. So JMS is often used for exactly that and uh, works well with Camel applications as well. Um, there's you know, Camel JMS support. Um, so if you're working with a non-Camel application, obviously you can use you know, Spring or any other JMS uh, technology. Um, I get the point being that it's a very easy mechanism of bridging applications generically so they don't have to talk directly. A um, little out of the scope for this, uh, this discussion, but just worth pointing out that uh, you know, JMS can really do that pretty well and pretty simply with uh, these type of integrations. All right. Sorry, that was a laundry list of use cases, but that's what happens. I start brainstorming. Um, where are we at on time? About done, 10 minutes? Five, 10 minutes? All right, I've got a bunch of other uh, somewhat high level, let's just fly through them, basically talking about the SDLC with regards to Camel. Some of this is common sense, but I put it down because this is exactly how I explain Camel to other people or to other uh, clients as I'm trying to uh, get Camel in the door and how to, how to actually work through a project start to finish with regards to Camel is the point of it. Um, so I'm gonna have to go through it pretty quick. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, you need to take a look at your requirements, whiteboard them out just like you would any other project, 
but the point being to start looking at the different aspects of your requirements with regards to how you're going to implement it in CAMEL. So some of these relevant requirements are uh, obviously SLAs, we talked about a little bit before, um, performance requirements to your system, uh, reliability, so we talked about like strict ordering of messages, that would be a reason you need to use something like message groups. Um, and then your overall error handling strategy, um, obviously that comes into play as well. So how are you going to handle errors in, you know, at runtime? So from there, there's a lot to cover. Um, so a quick discussion about how to break down these use cases. So once you have them all diagrammed out and you talk about your different use cases or message flows through your application, how do you take that and get that into, into a CAMEL application is what I'm trying to do. So to start with, you identify your processes for each use case. So in this case, uh, data flows or triggers or any type of periodic events that might fit into a CAMEL route in our case. Um, categorizing those processes somewhat so you know what type of performance characteristics are involved. Um, obviously, identify any technology interfaces. These would be um, components that you want to use within CAMEL. Identify those specific interfaces, even the versions of those interfaces to make sure CAMEL supports the right version and the configuration options you need to use. And then just start creating pseudo routes. So this is just general flows. Um, and here's you know, kind of a simple example of three different uh, three different uh, ways to process data, in our case file, HTTP, and JMS, all having some common, common components of them, but maybe three different um, ways of exposing that. Um, so from there, you, you know, at a high level, you basically need to walk through all those different use cases, and just like you would do with any other refactoring of code, you want to find any commonalities and start normalizing. Um, again, uh, exception handling requirements really affect the structure and the granularity. Um, of, of your routes. This is not a science either. It's, you gotta start with something and start refactoring, but just something to consider. Um, error handling often throws, throws these uh, applications into a much more com complex situation than they need to be. Um, at the end of the day, you're just trying to divide these up into configurable or uh, some type of deployable groups of routes. So from our simple example before where I said, here, you know, here's our original routes. Three things are basically doing the exact same thing. At the end of the day, you're taking in data, you're validating it, you're saving it. Um, a normalized way to look at that would be still defining three separate endpoints, but normalizing the, the validate and the save with a separate route. So it's kind of common sense, but just to get your head around how to, how to start processing that. Does that make sense? Basic, all right. Um, so from a development standpoint, I, I'm not gonna have time to go through all this stuff, but uh, just, this is basically me brainstorming out everything you need to do to set up a CAMEL uh, project. So you could use an archetype to stub it out, create some POC unit tests to really get started. Um, start creating route builder classes. This is a way to group together your routes into logical functional areas. Um, again, it's, uh, it's an art to doing it. Um, it'll take some time to get to do it well and generally just start out simple, put them all in one place, start dividing them out as, a, as complexity is reached. Um, some, Discussion about scoping we'll have to talk about later, but um, in terms of how many camel contacts you're gonna start, generally it's, it's one per app, but you, know, you can do it many different ways. Um, again, just talking about how to uh, start adding your routes, um, moving right through it. Um, talked a little bit about exception handling before. So again, these are the questions you gotta ask of your requirements. How are you gonna propagate errors back? How are you gonna trap those errors? Are you gonna retry them? Um, these are all things you gotta ask. There's not one simple way to do it. These are just my general best practices, I would say. Keep it simple. Um, don't assume you're gonna retry every exception all the time because it's gonna blow away your performance of your application. Um, so minimize how often you're gonna retry. Minimize, um, free, I guess, frequency of retries. And um, at the end of the day, you need visibility to all this, I guess is what I'm getting at. So you don't want to blindly retry things in the background and you'll never get visibility to what failed to begin with. So generally recommend moving things off into error queues or some, something else that's visible so you can actually quantify what's happening in your system. And so along those lines, you need some way to monitor that. So whether you use some type of email notification or some other log monitoring tool, um, or you're sending them to error queues where you can actually visualize them. Can that make sense? Um, quick uh, couple points on exception handling. 
I'll let you look that up on Camel's site. A couple of different ways to do it. Um, testing applications, um, again, you know, kind of common sense, ongoing effort, different types of tests, functional route performance tests. I'm just gonna fly through these. So here's a quick POC test. So this is just a standalone test where you can play around with Camel APIs. Um, I generally recommend, you know, as soon as you start working with Camel, spin up one of these. This allows you to, a, a little sandbox to play with different APIs and, and do some validation. Um, functional testing. Um, so this is, that's one of my favorite uh, graphics, sorry. Um, so functional testing. So this is uh, basically allowing you to test your, you know, your, your production routes, essentially, um, without having to um, pull those out in a, you know, a standalone unit test. So long story short, here's an example of a, uh, of a route that's set up. Very simple, direct endpoint to a SATA endpoint. Uh, here's how it could be wired together in a unit test. Um, scenario, so basically creating a camel context, wiring in your route builder, and then here's a test that basically um, uses a basically AOP um, intercepts to allow you to inject inject endpoints. So in this case, instead of sending it to our, is that right? Looks kind of weird. Um, instead of sending it to the inbound queue, it's going to intercept that and send it to to a mock endpoint that you can validate against. So the point of this being is you don't have to modify your original route code. It just allows you to intercept routes to do validation across different points within your route. So let's say you have five different points in your route. You can intercept at any point along the way. In this case, I'm just intercepting the sending to an endpoint. So if you go back to my oops, previous route here, so I'm basically intercepting the sending to this, to this queue so that I can validate what comes out of the, the first route. So pretty basic. But you can do a lot of cool things with it. And I'm probably about done here. Some performance testing real quick. Uh, same route that we talked about. This is just using a technology called the data set within Camel to allow you to basically pump data into a route. It gives you some pretty cool performance stats back with very minimal setup. Um, and again, a good way to kind of regression test your performance as you make route changes, you can see what dynamics of your performance are. And I think we'll probably wrap up, right? Um, so I do have some other information out there. If anybody wants to take a look, has any other questions or any, any feedback for that matter, let me know. Apologize for it being, uh, going way over, but talked about deployment a little bit and then a quick section on uh, refactoring legacy apps. Was, are the two areas we kind of skipped over. So that said, any questions? <laughs> yep. It's definitely more than a traffic cop. It's more of you can build applications with Camel. So, um, so it, it's lightweight. It can be run embedded within applications, or you can run it standalone and you have integration points through web service calls or JMS or any other technology to, to bind together these applications, if that makes sense. Um, so it could run, if you have an existing web app and you want to use some Camel technologies, you can embed it right inside that web app if you want. Uh, it could be either one. So, so most of the applications I build are standalone Camel applications that are doing high volume message processing and routing and complex patterns. But there are also other applications we work with that want to send data into, into Camel. And we bridge those with JMS generally. So that application doesn't need to know anything about Camel. It would just send data over through a web service call or JMS and that's the bridge between them. Um, but there's nothing to say you can't have very small Camel apps embedded in Differently, you just have to have a way to, for them to all talk. And they can't talk, you know, a camel context is specific to an application of JVM. So if you have two of them set up, they can't talk directly. They have to go through some bridging technology like JMS or REST or web services, that kind of thing. Make sense? Sorry, I don't have any books to give away or anything. <laughs> a good question.
Um, <clears throat> definitely anything too low level. Um, we've had a uh, like client I'm at now, we, we've had some discussion about redoing some, uh, and I, I touched on this a little bit, redoing some low level, um, like cron type of jobs that are doing some low level tasks. That's something I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to mess with. Um, they're better, better suited technologies. And then anything web related, uh, you know, exposing simple endpoints to consume data is one thing, but trying to build anything beyond that, in terms of like a web app or anything, that those generally aren't good use cases for it. Um, I mean, there's definitely, you know, as, I don't know if you saw the previous presentations by Jeff, Johan, and uh, who else did one? Keith did, Keith did one. Um, there's, there's good ways and bad ways to use it, for, you know, of course. Um, so there's, there's, you know, more importantly, it's, it's the performance characteristics and how you wire everything together that's, that gets you into trouble, where you build an application out and it just doesn't scale because of some subtle configuration options. So there, there's definitely some devil in the details type of thing, but um, that's about all I got. Mm -hmm. And I want this to be warehouse. I gotcha. So right now, you know, we could do it with like if we did a just concept where process and just do some maintenance, mm -hmm. or if uh, Camel was sitting there in between and it was providing updates to the rest of the system about like all the subscribers. So would this be a, like a good scenario of using your socket from Camel into? Uh, I Yeah, you need some buffer in between them. Yeah, but then, you know, the challenge is that uh, this is a web application, so, like, you know, the web app manager is also using the web browser. So, you can get a few SEO few, but then again, yeah, so they have an intermediary in there that you can use to the client, so it's just completely different because it's not really sure about that. Okay. Yeah, that's basically what Jeff was doing with, uh, with their project, too, was buffering with, in their case, they're using Cassandra to buffer requests if the back end system's down, but you need somewhere in between. Otherwise, like you said, it's, if it's point to point, something goes down, the, you get message loss if you don't have any, any place to put it right. in so between. At least Jen hasn't left yet. So at least Jen hasn't left yet. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Lucas, come on, you got something. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Do you have other? Uh, no. do I, I said I don't have any books. I've got this half drinking water. I have a question. So, what's the power of using a processor over the OWP? What's the real benefit of this? Uh, no real benefit. Um, it's. Control. Well, control over the, over the network, the extreme Yeah. Well, there you go. So, I mean, a, a bean, a, and you can get that with a bean too. But like Jeff said, it's an ex, it's an explicit explicit um, um, implementation that you're you're going to implement the process method that takes an exchange. So it's very explicit in terms of getting the exchange, doing something with it, putting it back. Um, if you use a just a bean, you can do essentially the same thing, but it's a little it's a little more under the covers and a little more archaic because it's not obvious what you're doing. Um, especially if you have a bean that has multiple methods on it. I think it's cool, but you but looking at it, it doesn't make any sense how they're wired together because it's not explicit. Like, I don't know. You're talking about Jeff? Go ahead. 
Um, if you're talking about trying to, trying to test your production routes without modifying them, you can do that with, with intercepting. Um, it's a little quirky, but you can, you can take a very complex application, stand it up in a unit test, and do assertions at any point along the way with using the uh, advise with. Yeah, well, so you're talking about testing a deployed application? Yeah, I mean, uh, all these commas on this deploy, right, and uh, they are connected to Oxygen. We don't do any mod. Uh, they are connected to, uh, let's say, test or take the template or something like that. So it's the regular test type. Yeah. No, um, that, that sounds really cool, and we've talked about doing exactly that kind of end-to-end, -end, you know, automated end-to-end -end testing is really what you're talking about. You deploy it into your real container, and you send messages in, you, expect, you get an expected output. Um, I really haven't done that. I mean, there's nothing preventing you from using any type of a, a data driving tool to, to do that, but it's just tricky in terms of how you're going to validate it how you're going to disable things in your, in your application and not actually modify the database so it's repeatable. Those are challenges. Jeff, have you ever done anything quite like that end-to-end -end where it stood up? Yeah, we actually run a couple of test times with the Hexagen. Oh, okay. Deployment in there to make everything work together and do end-to-end -to -end testing. So are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you like injecting like mock database calls and then how do you, how do you yeah, actually build it out? We'll you know what I mean? Going to your real database, yeah. yeah. I mean, That's a challenge for us is trying to. Make it as much of a test harness as you can in its own environment uh, if you're doing kind of like you know, not complete integration, but integration on your own machine. I mean, when you're starting to rely on Oracle and that sort of stuff, you know, it's, it's all injecting drivers at the end of the day. But we typically will fire everything up like in a packed exam, test harness on Jenkins, believe it or not, and then we'll actually initiate full, full. That's cool. And with the new HSQLDD, it's got an Aura, Oracle, um, uh, it, it can pretend to be Oracle a whole bunch of different types of databases, so you can get really close. That's cool. I mean, that's, that's always a hard thing is making it repeatable, right? Yeah. You run through one test, you clog up your database. How do you validate it? That's why HSQLDD yeah. is so darn cool. Yeah, we'll have to take a look. Cool. We've actually had it in some test harnesses where the client actually deployed it in production, not knowing better. And we had to <laughs> <laughs> a real database. They ran it for like six months without even knowing it. Wow. <laughs> so don't do that. Okay, I will. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Appreciate it.